Okay, we're going to continue our afternoon of networking related talks here in the technical deep dive track. Uh, and the talk that is up next is about uh, OpenStack and OpenFlow. So please welcome Samrat. Thank you. I'm Samrat. Uh, I am from NEC Corporation working on the OpenFlow. And uh, we have a uh, long history in this area from NEC working with Stanford to bring the whole OpenFlow and the software-defined networking into production. Slowly, we're also seeing the, how it has synergies to work with the OpenStack. So this talk is basically about uh, giving a primer on the OpenFlow and the SDN and how it fits into the OpenStack uh, architecture. So this is just a brief introduction to OpenFlow in case you know, some of you who are not aware of it. I guess you know, uh, right uh, in these years or in the last past years, people are all getting aware of what the OpenFlow means. Uh, if what you have here in the OpenFlow <coughs> is that you have a switch and then you have a controller and the controller is continuously or dynamically programming the flow tables in the switch so that it can change the forwarding behavior of the switch in a dynamic fashion in the way it wants it. And by that, it also enables a more a sort of intelligence and automation into the network. The second more important part of this whole OpenFlow protocol is that it is open and it allows you to work with uh, multiple vendors. So the way typically the OpenFlow protocol works is that there is a the three things, there is a rule, which is the matching criteria on the packet header fields, and then you have the action, which basically says what you want to do with the flow packets, whether you, which port you want to forward it to, whether you want to drop it or pass it, and then you can also gather information from the switch. So the important part why we are talking about OpenFlow and in relation to also OpenStack is the openness of the um, openness of the interface to the switch that you can have a controller and the controller can be either an open source controller or can be a proprietary controller but the important part is that the data plane is open so you can have uh, multi-vendor switches which supports OpenFlow become a part of your network and you can choose which vendor to bring in to create your network. So here we start with the premise of this talk. So what we understand is that the OpenFlow provides a switch level model which basically allows you to go and program the switch. And you also see the, uh, the uh, cloud orchestration model from the OpenStack which gives you the quantum and NOVA and the rest of the things. But particularly, we are mostly interested in quantum and NOVA which participates in the whole network behavior. But what we want to know by this whole talk is that uh, what is the middle ground between them? So you have a switch, you have the orchestration, who provides the network model from switch to the orchestration? So that's the part we are going to discuss initially in this talk. And in a simple sense, a network model means that, you know, as you all understand, is about, you know, give me the service to create a network and to attach uh, my um, <coughs> instances or the VMs to the network in an automated way. So the, the question here is that what is the uh, appropriate network model which connects these two parts? So in a conceptual architecture, again, you see is you need a network model and that connects the orchestration model. So the orchestration model can help to provide this type of service or consume them. Now coming back into what you need in a controller or a software defined network controller is that you need first is a open flow control so that you can go and control the different open flow switches which can be a virtual switch which can be a switch from any vendor which supports uh, open flow but on top of that you need a network control because just the switch control will only provide you so much you know it can only go and configure maybe an OVS or 
uh, maybe one physical switch, but you know, the, there can be a complex network topology of multiple switches connecting to multiple virtual switches. So someone has to consider about how do I do the end-to-end -end routing between you know, the appliances or between the VMs. So that's the network level control you want, right? And then on top of it, you need a model because without the model, you do not, you cannot create an API framework that can be consumed from the top orchestration layer or the OpenStack part of it. So that comes the plugin. But before you need to, before you can create a plugin, you need a, some sort of a, um, a model that can um, define uh, such a network, which is not just a switch base, but end to end. Yes. So that is where uh, we come to a, some sort of requirements based on which you know, we have been working on such defining such type of a virtual network model. But it, it came out from the uh, software defined network standpoints and we'll see that how it actually relates to the APIs in the quantum side as well. But before going there, I want to know like what would be such requirements which we are trying to capture here. The first is that you, you're capturing the network virtualization. It's an important part uh, which is required to create services on top of it. And one of that virtualization is that it cannot be just on the, the virtual uh, switch world, but it also has to capture the physical switch. So it has to be a network view that spans from the virtual switch to the physical switch to the entire data center network in that case. And it also has to support the multi-tenant view, which we all understand from the OpenStack world. And then it has to have the ability to control an end-to-end network from VM to the VM, or from VM to the appliance, or to the gateways. The, the second part, which is very important in the, in the case of uh, OpenStack, is that it requires an on-demand provisioning. So, it can't be a network which is pre-created, statically defined, a pool of resources which you just go and absorb, but it has to be a network that creates created in an on-demand fashion, can be deleted in an on-demand fashion, and also it has to have the ability to be configured because you always are seeing a lot of changes in the whole um, you know, uh, system in terms of where the VMs are getting deployed, where they're scheduled, where they're moving. And and added to that, the part when you're talking about the physical network, you're also talking about a lot of optimization issues. Uh, when you're talking about, let's say, high performance, bandwidth, or you're talking about resiliency or redundancy in the network when you have a multi-hop network between the VMs. So, so who is going to take care of that? You, you cannot bring out all of that uh, level of um, <coughs> optimization back into the orchestration layer. So certain things has to be hidden, but they has to be a part of the whole network provisioning. And the third part, when you're talking about, again, a entire cloud-level orchestration, you have to also consider that it can't be tied to a particular topology. It can be like, you know, this is a uh, more vendor proprietary uh, architecture you have to choose, or there cannot be things like constraints about VLANs, or there cannot be, again, like location type of things, like when you're talking about VMs which can move from one place to another. So these are the three main uh, requirements which can define a good network model that can then be consumed by, by the top uh, quantum level services. So how does it look like in general? What it, what it essentially has is uh, a switching link, which is an open flow type of a network. <coughs> and the open flow network is um, using the open flow control. And what you want is from the switch model to go to a network model is a, uh, is a virtual tenant network that actually we define here. And the virtual tenant network allows you to create multiple virtual network. Each is defined in an independent way. They can have their own ways to define what network policies, what are the endpoints you connect. They essentially reside independently uh, in a way that it doesn't interfere, but they all reside on top of the same physical network. So the whole network model which we have been talking in terms of the requirement is a layer which you need to add on top of a controller which is talking open flow to all the switches that can create such an exposition of the resources in an abstract model and that is the virtual tenant network model. Once you have such a model, then you can then think of that what would be the right APIs 
and that can be consumed by the higher orchestration layers. So here is a uh, way the model is created and the requirements which we have been stating so far. So it's a, it's a model uh, which is very much looks like a uh, network model as opposed to uh, object type of a model. You can see here there is a topological property here. So you define virtual bridges which actually represents um, a particular layer to network. And before defining the virtual bridges, let me say the entire network actually represents a tenant very much like what you see in a project, basically maps to a tenant in this particular case. Now once you go inside that network, you have the virtual bridges and then you have the virtual routers which can connect you know, all the layer to network. And then you have virtual links which are essentially defining your abstract uh, uh, virtual network topology. And the, and the square <coughs> parts are the points where it finally connects to the physical world. And the physical world can be a physical host, it can be a virtual machine, it can be a physical appliance. That's the part which maps the external world into the virtual network world. And then this entire virtual network can then be translated into the physical network, but the controller make that happen automatically where the orchestration layer or the one who is trying to define that doesn't have to worry about what the physical network is or how the, uh, the virtual switches are connected into the physical network. So you're creating an abstraction layer which hides the, or I would say decouples, the physical network connectivity, the switches, the configuration of the switches totally outside the boundary of how you are using the virtual network from an orchestration automation standpoint. So here it shows a scenario where you can have a different virtual tenant network uh, that each tenant can have their own ways to define. One can just have a layer two network. Uh, another can have multiple layer two networks connected by um, a router and they all can be overlaid or uh, deployed. I don't want to use the word overlay uh, it's our physical network deployment. They all virtual networks can be deployed on top of the same physical network. And they can work independently without affecting each other. So that's, that's the general view of how you are defining the multi-tenant virtual networks in the case of a software-defined network. So now let's come and connect to uh, the quantum uh, side of it. So in case of a quantum, what it wants is it also needs to create a dynamically the virtual tenant network. It has the concept of the project, it has the concept of the network. So what it wants is that it, it wants in a simple case, uh, give me a layer to network and also um, you, can, you want to uh, add or delete or modify um, the whole virtual network or the layer to network depending upon how the VMs uh, are coming in and getting connected through the OBS or even in a physical network thing. And what the OpenFlow network controller is supposed to do is that it should automatically detect the, the topology uh, of the entire network, again, which consists of the virtual switches and the physical switches and how they're connected. It should ensure that however the VMs are connected, the way the VMs are connected to a particular layer two network, accordingly, the controller has to go and dynamically install the flows in each of the switches so that they are connected. And as I said, at the same time, it has to support uh, all the features uh, which <coughs> someone wants in the actual network, which means uh, multipath or end-to-end -end reliability or flow migration in case of VM migration, all of that has to be also a part of the thing. So it can't be just like, you know, I get connected, but it also should provide with some of the optimization which, which brings the physical network and the virtual network together. So here is a simple uh, scenario where, you know, you can uh, uh, think of a deployment. Uh, it's orchestration layer which basically uh, creates the network and create the subnet 
So it comes to the quantum the NEC plugin, which um, is uh, open and downloadable and uh, now available with the Folsom. So that basically then uh, talks to the open flow network controller. So initially when you create a network, uh, a bridge is created because it represents a layer two network. And at the same time, and automatically a DHCP agent is also created and you can see they are essentially connecting to the external and the external is connecting to the VBridge to the virtual link. So that's your first level of uh, um, creation of a virtual network which happens when the uh, quantum is called for creating a network. And this is gone back to the controller. The controller will ensure that you know that is deployed in whatever switching topology you have in the underlying network. So let me show at the same time some demos at the while we go through the talk. So this is a simple demo I'm going to show where we have uh, two um, open flow switches. Um, they are from NEC and they are um, controlled by a, a dual redundant controller for reliability. And then you have uh, two hosts with, uh, let's say, two VMs. So here is a network creation. Uh, you are providing the network name. And then providing the network block. The gateway is optional, but we are providing the gateway of the router. So you have the network created, but now let us go into the so this is actually the controller interface. It's not that someone has to see that, but it is just to show you what is actually happening in the controller when the network got created from the uh, horizon. <coughs> so here we are actually in the controller server and we are trying to show you what has happened by running the status of the configuration. So you can see here that there is this, there is a script which corresponds to the virtual network that got created. So there is a V bridge definition. So is a bridge was created for the layer two network. There was an external created, which was actually mapping to the DSP agent. And then there is a V link which was created to connect them. So I think I missed you another part here, let me show you. So this is the important part in the, also from the same user interface which comes from the controller. You can, you can see here, that the topology which is shown in, in the demo, there is a two virtual switch connected to the two physical switch and in the left side, you can see that's the virtual network which is representing the one of the virtual bridge for the layer two network got created. So that's a very simple thing you can see here when you're trying to create a network. So now the next part is uh, I want to create a um, instance and I want to connect that to the layer two network which I just created. So the orchestration system asks the Nova scheduler or the Nova scheduler to the Nova compute to create a VM. And then what it does, it, it asks the quantum to create a port. And from that port, it gets the port ID, the virtual port ID, which, which is the, uh, uh, to, to, for, for the network and also the MAC address. And as we know, the quantum will go and back to the DSCP uh, to ensure that for that MAC address, there is a static IP address mapping. So once the Nova compute get that, it all creates the tab device for the OVS, and then it boots the VM. So what the NEC agent, uh, or it is any agent essentially which is sitting there, it is doing is it is basically trying to uh, see is there any new tab device which got added into the whole system. 
And if there is a new addition of the app devices, what it gets is it gets the actual, the virtual switch port ID, or the port which refers to the virtual switch, the DP ID which refers to the switch ID essentially from the open flow context, and the port ID which was given from the quantum, and it sends it back to the, the plugin which is residing in the quantum. So given the port ID, given the OVS port and the DP ID, these two basically tells you that what switch and what port the new VM got attached. Now, this is enough for the plugin to go and create an external into the virtual network and then connect, attach the VM to, uh, to add into the virtual network. So you can see now the virtual network, which was originally only had the DSCP agent, now has the VM with the external, and then external got connected to the virtual bridge. Now your network has changed, and it has attached the new VM into that. So in this same way, you have new VMs coming into the, um, being created from the Nova compute in any of the host machines. They all essentially are adding into the uh, virtual network, and the same process can be also be done for deleting as well. So in the case of a delete, the agent basically just sends the port ID back to the quantum, and it deletes the port ID. The quantum NEC plugin knows for a given port ID what is the obvious port and the obvious DP ID, so he basically removes it. So in that way, you are able to add as well as you have to delete. The point is now the plugin is able to go and change the, the, the virtual network in the controller, and the controller using the open flow is able to dynamically change the entire network setting, whether you have a two switch network, which you're showing here, or a 100 switch network. So to show that, let me show you a demo for uh, instance creation, and you can see here that at the right side, you have the four switches, the two virtual switch and the two physical switch. On the left side, which is that virtual network, there is only uh, one um, VM which is connected to that, which represents a DSCP. So we're creating the first VM here choosing the instance name, and then we are connecting into that network which we just created before. So this first VM was created, then we go and create a second VM. We want to show finally they can connect, otherwise uh, there's no meaning to just getting attached to the network, right? So it's the second VM we are creating. Uh, it's actually it's the third VM we are creating here. So you can see there, there are three VMs uh, starting with 176, which are getting created here. Now, let us go back here. So it had one just which was representing the DSCP. Now going forward, we are just refreshing that and it shows you that there are three VMs which got attached to the virtual bridge. And that all happened based on the successive triggers which we were discussing here from the uh, Nova compute to the adding the device, getting to the um, plugin, plugin essentially changing the VTN and then it is deploying that. So let's see going for forward We are going to go into one of the VM, and then we are going to ping to the other VM, which we just got created here. So you can see that the ping is working between the two VMs we just got created. An entire thing was automated right from creation to connecting to the network and then creating the, the flow table 
between the physical switch uh, spanning the virtual switches and you can even see the track the flow here uh, showing like you know how the two VMs are communicating here. Same thing you can actually track in the physical network as well. Yeah, this shows you how the one of the VM connected to one of the switch virtual switch goes through the physical switch and then goes into the other VM. So this gives you an idea of how the, at the edge, the VMs were able to go and attach and finally the controller is able to go and patch the end-to-end -end network by controlling the flow tables in each of the virtual switches. So this is what you then see as the overall picture of when you're essentially deploying such a system. You can have a different type of network topology which is connecting your host and you can have OVS which are holding onto different VMs. And what you're able to do is you're able to do automatically end-to-end -end forwarding so, which means you do not have to worry about today you have two switches, tomorrow you go and connect some few more switches, you know, add more capacity, change the links. You do not have to worry from the uh, OpenStack viewpoint because all of that is essentially taken care of by the controller who is automatically detecting the topology and ensuring that when there is a VM which wants to communicate, how to create the path. Secondly, it is creating you, giving you the, with the multipath. So, you are able to do um, <coughs> get uh, more end-to-end -end bandwidth and not just limited to layer two, but also layer two and layer three. Uh, third, you are getting redundancy in the network, so any link goes down, any switch goes down, it is always going to create backup path, so your, your traffic is always, uh, uh, your, your, your paths are always there between any of the VMs. And the last part is, you know, respond to changes, which means that if there is any sort of change in terms of addition of VM, in terms of changing the layer two, any of those things, they're all basically are responding dynamically and uh, to how the flows get set up. So, and the, and the next point is, uh, because of the virtual network definition, you're also ensuring that all the virtual networks are isolated, which means if, these VMs are belong to the same virtual network or even the virtual tenant network, so they cannot go and talk to the other VMs. So all that isolation at the level of the project, at the level of the layer two networks are all essentially defined from the virtual network standpoint. And the, another important part we want to say here is that because this entire network is location free, which means you're not actually going and doing any sort of configuration into the ports of the switches. Your definition or mapping is essentially totally port-based, which is happening at the vSwitch level. So because there is no particular uh, bindings of a address block or a VLAN into the switch plane, you can easily move the VM from one place to the another place because your definition actually is defined from that virtual network not from the physical network. So as long as your VMs are essentially connected to the right virtual network, it will remain a part of the same virtual network in terms where it moves. So let me show um, that video. It's a little bit complex, but idea is to just give you a flavor of what is happening here. So we want to check onto one particular uh, VM which is connected to the same network. And we are going to go and do a live migration from one host to the other host, which is getting connected to a different uh, OVS. So right now the migration is happening.
So in the left side, the virtual network, there's no change because even though the VM has moved from one host to the other host, it still is the part of the same virtual network topology because it is still connects to the same V bridge, which is the same layer two network. But in the right side, which shows the physical topology, that's where the change has happened. So we, we go here and see all the um, icons which are connecting to the, uh, the physical uh, switch. Now we will sh we'll ensure that, you know, it. So you can see here, the, the one which got, which was initially connected to the virtual switch 192, 168, 8100, that link is gone. So essentially, what happened was that particular VM, when it got moved, that, that particular external is no longer there. So the controller essentially has taken out that particular external from there. Instead, it has added a new external, which you can see in the left side because the VM has moved from the right side of the V-switch to the left of the V-switch. So this, this is a good for illustration. It is not someone has to really care about when they're doing it, but it shows that you're able to move the VMs freely across the network from one V-switch to another V-switch without having to worry about whether you know, your switch has to be provisioned with the right VLANs or you have to change the VLANs, any of those things. So this is a typical deployment scenario. So essentially what you need is a, uh, for deployment of such a system, <coughs> you need a management network which connects your uh, controller. And then uh, what you need is the cloud controller or the OpenStack node where you have to uh, deploy the, uh, the NEC plugin and the NEC agent. The agent is the one actually which essentially uh, tracks the uh, the port, the tap devices, and, and then communicates it back to the plugin to, for adding the VMs and deleting them. And then you have the compute node, which basically has just the agent part. So once you have these three components, you can then attach that into any um, devices, open flow devices, and get the entire network end-to-end -end automated, connected, and provisioned in an on-demand way. It shows that some of the open flow interoperable switch, while I'm giving a talk here in OpenStack, uh, there is another group in Open Network Summit in, uh, back in San Jose. And uh, this basically is showing that, you know, what are the different type of switches which are now uh, are participating in the open flow for you to select and create your network. So there are many such vendors. There are more vendors coming in. They're all supporting OpenFlow 1.0 and then going into more uh, the 1.3 support, which has more advanced features. So it's a great choice for anyone that you have the flexibility to choose uh, between so many different vendors. Actually, this was a class topology created with certain features uh, which different switch vendor provides, like whether it, you know, it's a 40G switch or um, 10G switch or a 1G switch, right? And then you have the opportunity to um, uh, automate the entire system end to end, and you do not have to worry about uh, the configuration and the optimization of the entire network, which is totally taken care of by the controller. Plus, the controller is not limited to just these simple features, which is about creating a layer two network and adding that. It also brings the value of having the same L2 and the layer three defined at this point of time, uh, the, the layer three network APIs are not yet mapped to the uh, controller uh, layer three APIs, but in future that will be done where you will be able to do even the layer three provisioning through that without have to go through a layer three agent, which is the current, uh, uh, the traditional uh, framework which you have in the OpenStack. In addition to that, there are other features which are coming in, like you know how to add ACLs into that or how to uh, bring in appliances into that. So these are basically where uh, we need to figure out how the quantum APIs uh, can be mapped into these uh, more advanced features into that. So this is a great start. This is a start where it allows you to do simple network, but it still gives you a lot of optimization uh, automatically from the underlying network. So that's sort of the 
um, end of this uh, talk, which is basically created to give you an introduction on to how the OpenFlow is being used in the OpenStack. But for further information or for trial, you can contact us where you can learn more about you know, how they can be deployed or what are the issues we are seeing or you know how they can more information about uh, the SDN side of it. Thank you very much. Any questions? Say again. Do you have a deployment aspect which is there that you share when, uh, when you have overlapping IP addresses in your logs? Um, so the question is that if you have a deployment when you have overlapping IP addresses between different tenants, yeah, that is possible here. The, the controller or the open flow uh, can have different virtual tenant network with overlapping IP addresses. But within a particular virtual network, you cannot have uh, overlapping IP address between two L2 domain. How would you pass it to security system to take care of all the architecture and make the metrics? The architecture? Is this what you're asking? Yes, so this picture, uh, if you're asking the question about uh, the IP addressing in this particular case, so you know, if you leave out the management and the secure channel, which is basically connecting the all the system, once you come into the data plane, they are the flows are essentially defined uh, where they are segmented from a uh, tenant standpoint, which means that a particular tenant, whatever he does, whether he creates what IP address or his layer to definition, does not impact the other tenant. There is a flow level isolation in each of the uh, switches to ensure policies of one does not uh, go and impact others. So today you have uh, multiple organizations and they can have their own network. Today what the problem is one organization trying to do something can go and make the entire network inconsistent. This is not going to happen here because there's a full isolation between the, the definition and the policies of the virtual networks here. Okay, so the question is that every time there is certain changes happening in terms of adding a VM or migration of the VM or any changes, does the controller go and changes the flow tables in each of the switches? So it's a metal world, but the, it's, the pattern is like a uh, metal node, not Okay. So that uh, the question is different. So what you're asking is that if there is a lot of traffic going on, then is there some sort of a change in the flow table to balance the network? Yeah, if the, if the flow involved, it becomes very complicated. Yes, exactly. So what happens is in the multipath, so it, it, what it does is that based on the load of the network, it will create up to eight paths between any endpoints. And it does that by automatically detecting the topology and finding out if there exist such alternate paths to balance the traffic. And that is totally done by the controller. Okay, so the question is that if it is a pre-configured or dynamically done, so it is all done dynamically. All you can, you have to specify, or you can specify how many paths you want to use. After that, the balancing is done dynamically.
Okay, so the question is that in the migration, um, I'll just take his question last. Uh, it's a good question. So in the migration, you are actually moving on the same layer two network, but you're moving from one physical virtual switch into another virtual switch. Uh, when, you're, when you're moving, it, you are talking about whether there is a layer three network you're crossing or not. Remember, an open flow network is not a layer two or a layer three network. That's a definition which is at the virtual network level. The, at the open flow switch level, it just means that something has moved from a particular given port into another port, and I have to ensure that he gets connected based on the definition of layer two or layer three. Absolutely nothing. The, all you are doing is the controller automatically goes and changes the floatable entries, but there is nothing you have to do. You do not, because there is no concept of boundary. The boundaries are defined in mostly in a legacy network where you have the concept of a subnets and VLANs. So you're crossing boundaries, let's say, from a routing boundary. Right here, there is no concept of a boundary. That's why it is called a location-free network, essentially. So uh, I think uh, the time is up, uh, but if there is any further questions, you, know, you can either contact me or we can discuss it later. Thank you very much.